welcome everybody to tonight's program. Uh, my name is Natasha Egan, and I am the executive director of the Museum of Contemporary Photography at Columbia College Chicago. And we're really honored to have this program tonight uh, with Aspect Ratio Gallery and with Jennifer Ameta, who will be co-hosting. Uh, this is in honor of our event for the MOCP called Dark Room. It's our fundraiser event coming up on June 10th where we have a wonderful auction uh, presented by Celebes this year. And we're very excited to have programs to talk about the artist works that are in the auction, um, as well as about collecting in general. So I'm very happy to have you all here today when we have a wonderful group of panelists um, that Jennifer Amata is going to um, introduce. But first I would like to introduce Jennifer. So um, Jennifer is the director, currently the director of Aspect Ratio Projects here in Chicago. And we are partnering with tonight uh, for this collection program. She will introduce and moderate all the panelists. Uh, we have a great esteemed group of collectors and artists who I thank very much um, for being here tonight and for your support of MOCP as well. Jennifer has been dedicated to supporting artists for over 20 years. She founded her Chicago gallery, Jennifer Amata Fine Arts in 1996, with the goal of providing a space for educating collectors and advocating for artists. In 1999, she moved to Los Angeles and continued to consult clients on how to build meaningful collections while supporting emerging and mid-career artists, very similar to MOCP's mission there. <laughs> uh, in 2004, she moved back to Chicago and with a focus on both private and institutional collections, she became a founding member of the Museum of Contemporary Arts Acquisition Board Emerge in, to, in to, uh, 2020, sorry, 20, 2004. <laughs> Emerge is dedicated to bringing emerging artists into the MCA's permanent collection. As programming chair on the executive committee of Emerge, Jennifer worked to bring opportunities to both artists and collectors that encouraged engagement and sparked curiosity in the arts. In 2020, Jennifer took the helm at Aspect Ratio Projects, where, we, where she's represented here tonight. Um, and has been and has influenced the programming to include emerging and mid-career interdisciplinary conceptual artists focused on painting, photography, and sculpture. So we're really happy to have uh, Jennifer here tonight, and I'm going to turn the program over to her, who will lead the, uh, who will moderate the conversation. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, or um, it's, a, it's an informal gathering. So after the presentation, we'd also welcome you to unmute and ask your questions yourself. Um, so, uh, and this is being recorded just to let you know so that other people can uh, view this uh, who are unable to be here this evening. So thanks very, very much. And I'm gonna turn it over to you, Jennifer. Thank you so much. I'm so thrilled to be here. Um, I actually really, really enjoy doing these things. I always learn so much. Um, there's so much to continually learn in this field. Um, and so just a quick note before we get going, because I know um, we really want to talk to Mamadou Catherine and uh, our wonderful artists. But um, you know, aspect ratio, you summed it up, uh, Natasha. We're our focus is really, really heavily on engagement and and working with collectors and educating them and working with artists and advocating for them. And so my theory with all of this is that, you know, we're dealing in an unregulated market and relationships are vital. So with, with regard to the artists that we were, were fortunate enough to work with, such as Cameron, Derek, and Jovan, it's heavily relationship-based, but I look at it as a partnership. So whatever their goals are, I'm there to try and, and forward those goals for them. And on the collector side, because we deal in conceptual art, even though photography is going to be represented here, it's conceptual photography. And you know, what does that mean? I'm going to borrow from Cameron in that he said this very well one time in that you know, it means that the gesture is actually, the idea is bigger than the gesture, right? So the image that you're seeing may be wonderful, beautiful, thought provoking or whatever it is, but there's an idea behind that that, that is more important actually than what you're viewing. And so, education is really key for me and I'm not this isn't a shameless plug but on our site we're very focused on putting you know in the artist's own words what that piece is about and I'm hoping that this conversation actually helps shed light on some of that 
in terms of getting into collecting and breaking down those barriers because it can be kind of scary if you don't know how to navigate it. Um, and then as well as like how you continue to learn and educate and curiosity is key. Curiosity, I think, drives a lot of really wonderful collections. And it sounds like Mamadou and Catherine have that going for them. But then the ultimate mantra for me, and they can echo this if they believe it or not, is buy what you love, buy what you like, buy what interests you, because there's always more art. <laughs> so having said that, let's start a little bit at the beginning and walk people into how you two started to collect um, and maybe share with us your, the first piece that you purchased um, and why? And then Natasha, maybe we go to that first image. Natasha's manning the whole thing here. So we are, I'm indebted to her for this. <laughs> there we go. So good, good evening. Can you hear us well? Yes. Yes, wonderful. So Mama Dussar here and uh, my better half is on the other side of the Zoom call, but not in the same room. So we'll have to coordinate by winking and smiling. Uh -huh. And so uh, happy to share how we started collecting, I would say as good uh, over 18 years ago. And I'm gonna say that uh, I started it, unless Catherine will object to that. Uh, but uh, I did start that by traveling around the world and having an interest for art in general, but uh, in particular, the medium of photography. And the reason why I was attracted by photography it comes from uh, both, we have similar background. We were born and raised in France, but we have heritage from West Africa. And often photography was a medium by where you were remaining uh, close to families and siblings and, and receiving them by letters uh, after a couple of weeks of waiting it was always a, a great pleasure to see black and white pictures of the family. But then I started venturing myself into uh, markets and art fair in Paris uh, often by myself and uh, asking questions to uh, galleries and artists. And that's how I started collecting. And Catherine can share more about her, her take on that because I started having a portraiture that I was collecting and we've been together for 20 plus years and she was just reluctant to have them uh, in, in our house and uh, displayed as such. Okay. So I'll let Catherine kind of elaborate on that and then I can talk about the first piece. Catherine? Um, hi, good evening, um, everybody. Um, I'm Catherine Saar. So Mamadou is right. He, he studied our collection and photography and those historical photography that we'll see later on the um, Seducata, Mamakase, uh, where um, some of his first pieces and acquisition. Mm -hmm. And I was very, very reluctant to have them on our wall and because um, they're very similar to pictures that we have in our family album. And what has become a joke, but I was not joking at that time. And I, I was telling him, why would we have somebody else, grandparents on our wall? Um, but that leads me to the introspection and historical aspect of collecting and those pictures um, in particular, because they are very important in the overall history um, of photography, but also African photography. So he pulled me into the, the collecting world through the history. Um, that's very important for me and protecting our heritage. Yeah. And then the first piece we have here on the picture, you have a piece from Kara Walker that was just on the first we acquired. But in the first week we acquired was actually a bronze uh, from a Senegal that was a representation of a soldier called Lightjore. And Lightjore was known for fighting the French uh, during the, uh, the, the, uh, the colonies era and actually going back to the 1800s. And so for us, the art of collecting is also a introspection exercise that goes deeper into our own heritage. We do have an eclectic collection, but the pieces that we tend to kind of gravitate towards have a dimension that actually touches us in one way, shape or form. And so the beauty of it is that photography as a medium, as you mentioned, Jennifer, can be a dual. There is what you see and there is also what the artist is, is meant to express through the lens of a camera. And that's why actually I love the medium of photography because often like a painting, you will kind of get a feel of what the artist is trying to portray. But then an image of a, uh, uh, of any type, it could be a landscape or any type of photography, there is often a, a deeper narrative that goes into it. And so I think that's a great way to kind of kick up the conversation and dive into you know, how you collect, how do you assess photography and, and how does it fit into a collection as well? 
Exactly. So when you're approaching photography specifically, are you, are you confronted first with the image or are you doing research behind the scenes to find those images? I mean, maybe now as your, as your collection has evolved, how, how has that changed? Because I think that's yeah. kind of one of the things people are really wondering, do they just wander through galleries okay. or do they go and do all this research and then go to the galleries? How, how has that worked for you? So I, I am a bit of a nerd and known, known for that. So I like the research piece of it. I think this is the most fascinating part. So discovering an artist, placing the artist in a time and a place, trying to draw parallels, it's things that I actually enjoy. So I have an Excel spreadsheet. I have notes about the artist. I love to have an opportunity to visit galleries. Uh, but ultimately, you tend to be touched first with emotion about what you see or what you feel. And for photography, it may be what you see first. Now, a bit uh, take that class of photography so I understand the composition of a picture. Now, uh, when it comes to collecting, I'm not very perspective around how does it fit into my own narrative of what I've learned by taking photography. But ultimately, I like to kind of separate images in three, see what's happening, understand the texture of the, the photograph as well, and go deeper on that. And so that's how I approach it. Uh, I have emotional uh, collecting habits where I'll just see a piece and it's, it's just visceral, I wanna buy it. I have other pieces that will basically uh, be on my list for weeks, months, if not years, before I ended up uh, acquiring them if, if I ended up doing so. So it's very, uh, it depends, I would say, there's not a way to do it. But for me, the research piece of it is actually very interesting and very, it gives you a better sense of what the artist yeah, is doing and where he's sitting mm -hmm. at uh, Now, Catherine, or is that how, how you feel as well? Yes, um, for, for me, it's really the, uh, the meaning uh, of the, the photography. Um, sometimes it's obvious and we understand the story of the, uh, the the picture, but the meaning is very important. And then there's the um, uh, the aesthetic aspect as well that that I can't deny. So it's it's a balance. So we have some work that um, has is that we acquire really for the meaning um, in our collection, how they fit, um, and some is, is is purely visual. So we have that balance. Perfect. I actually think. Um, now might be an interesting time to have this juxtaposition of you researching and looking for artists and photography in particular that appeals to you, to an artist who, all, Cameron Gaynor, Jovan Speller, and Derek Woodsmore are all research-based artists. But in particular right now, I think it might be nice to speak with Cameron um, and speak about a couple things, Cameron. Here's a, here's a piece. So Cameron engages in very long-term quite elaborate projects that are heavily research based. Um, and the other thing I wanted to address along with that is, is size. And in that last photograph that you had, I think living with art, you did a really nice job of, of placing pieces in a small spot because so many times people say, well, I don't have the space for it. I don't know what to do with it. So Cameron, if you can address like how you think about size with relationship to your pieces and maybe what your research practice is like when you take on these projects. Yeah, sure, thanks. Um... And thanks for that introduction. I, you know, um, two things. It, um, it's funny to talk about uh, the moment when you fall in love. I'm, I'm just uh, appreciating what Mamadou said about falling in love with something and, and knowing that you want it. And then there's a the realization of like, well, does it fit in the house or where are we going to put it kind of situation? And, um, and the projects that I do, um, you know, I have a, a relationship with them because they don't have to um, maybe ascribe to a particular space when I'm thinking about how they exist it's sort of living with an image and then determining at what scale it can really be felt or heard. I guess it's almost like, um, like a poem and like the, the, uh, the, the level of volume of a voice. Um, so like some poems really need to be um, yelled or, or need to have a, a very loud um, uh, affirmative voice and others can be sort of whispers or um, be quiet and, or maybe have quiet space in between them. Well, uh, it, it, with my projects, it takes me, <laughs> one of the hardest things for me to do is to go from actually shooting the image to, to printing it. And um, in many cases, what I do is I actually using uh, projection to scale the image um, to sometimes hundreds of different sizes on the wall. And I'll live them with that way, just projecting on the wall. And then um, I'll, I'll reduce that down to about 40 different scales and then have all those scales printed 
um, and then and then put them up on a wall and live with them. And then from that point, determine um, which scales are are speaking, which which scales remove that um, space where as a viewer, you're actually able to enter into the um, image and have a conversation with the image in a way. And, um, and what, what I think is that that's important with what I do in terms of content is that um, oftentimes I'm shooting things that um, maybe on, on, on a basic level look sort of like, well, this is a perfect image for that. It's, so, it's it fireflies in a, um, a very particular firefly in a very particular place in the country um, that it only exists at. But most people see this image and think, oh, it's just fireflies. When it hits the right scale, when it's printed, you know, to my specifications, I, I think the the bigger conversation that comes to light is, is really the sort of like mechanics of photography in a way. The, the this idea of like, well, could I take something like light, which is which is what creates all of photography, and actually turn light into the actual um, subject? Um, and in this way, light is both creating the image, so we're actually seeing a negative, the forest behind it but it's also um, a space where there's almost no information in the actual photograph. Um, and no, I see that, uh, Jasmine, it, it does look like that was also intentional, this sort of like macro micro. Can I, could I shoot something that's very earth-based and make it look like the universe and have that sort of inflection point? And um, that's also thematically that happens throughout some of the, the other pieces as well. But um, it's interesting in this age where we are so screen-based um, and I think a lot of practices, some practices can kind of translate into Instagram and um, some other kind of uh, formats. And I've actually never been able to, I took down my own website I've never posted on my Instagram because I, I don't feel like I've done a project yet that actually communicates that well. And it's funny to say, because we're all looking at screens right now. And, and I, I think you can appreciate the photograph, but really it's seeing it at full, at the intended scales where I really do think you kind of fall into it um, in a way that's, that to me is kind of like, is like falling in love or something. Like you, you just, you trust that moment and it allows you in. So scale specifically is, is super, specific that way. And a very big part of just the larger, uh, for me, research-based practice. I, I love that idea of research-based um, collector and really um, resonate with that idea because I think that um, in photography in particular, it tends to have both artists and collectors um, who uh, appreciate this sort of like um, detail and the mechanics of, of the thing. I think it's, um, uh, to your point, like it, it brings all of us nerds forward and, and, and generally we'll like sit down and start talking about our first cameras or like what cameras we're using right now, or, uh, something like that. But then um, th there's something unique about how research lends itself to lens-based practices. And, um, and so that, that uh, to me is, um, is very natural in terms of why photography works for the projects that um, I pursue and that oftentimes take uh, three to four years to produce. So let me ask you this, and then I'll bounce it back to Mamadou and Catherine. So Cameron, when you're creating a piece, are you taking from the get-go, are you, are you thinking all the way down the line to the sale or how that's going to look in someone's home? Not, not the transaction, I don't mean, but how that translates into someone's home. And then after you're finished, I think maybe Mamadou or Catherine, when you're looking to acquire your piece, are you you know, are you thinking, oh, I need something for this wall and it's going to be the scale, or I have a feeling I know the answer to this, but I think it would be nice for people to hear. So maybe we'll start with you, Cameron. And then sure. um, I can be really quick about this. I think, um, I don't think about the sale, but what I do think about doing is making work that, um, that allows people in, uh, that invites them into a conversation. And so in a way, I think um, I'm trying to work with ideas and, and um, images that are as beautiful as they are complex and um, hopefully have com complex narratives. Um, and, and generally, you know, when I'm, when I'm making them, I'm not thinking about the, like the containment of them. Um, and so, you know, some of my photographs are pretty large and I know that's complicated. Um, and in fact, I've probably worked, I think more with museums that, that tend to have really big space that it can accommodate that, but also not all of the photographic work is, is big. And the works that are smaller are not smaller because I'm thinking about their portability, but more that that's, they, all, they still communicate at smaller sizes. Um, but uh, so I, it's, it's, I, hadn't, I hadn't had to think about it that way, but I don't, I'm not thinking about collectors homes um, but I love the idea that someone would maybe like knock down a wall or, or give over a bedroom <laughs> to a work because it's just too big to fit someplace else. 
Uh, okay, Mama Joe and Catherine, are you going to knock down a wall for a piece of art? <laughs> I don't think well, you have any walls <laughs> anyway. Well, the reality is that yeah. we we oh. don't think about the space, and that's it may be a mistake sometimes. But for us, art allows all your emotion to you know be expressed as such. So if you start putting a constraint on it, it kind of change your own. It brings a lot of biases, right? And so we like to feel without any constraints. Now we come down to the reality of the door. How do we get the piece in the house? And also the, the size of the wall. And Catherine will smile because about four days ago, I took my meter out and I was trying to measure a wall knowing that the piece was actually 20 feet long and I don't have any 20 feet long wall. <laughs> and she saw me on, on, on the floor measuring, said, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I'm trying to acquire a piece that is 20 feet long. It's like, it's not going to fit. Forget about it. <laughs> so, so that's the reality of it. Catherine, if you want to comment on that, but uh, I know you gave me a hard time for measuring uh, uh, a, a, a 10 feet wall into a 20 feet wall. The, the, the space coming to... Um in our decision where we know we don't have the space because right now we actually don't have space so it's uh are we willing to remove something or move things or is it going to go straight into storage uh which is heartbreaking um so right now in we are at the time of our collecting journey where we 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 need to find space every time uh we acquire something so it's not really it comes at the the space comes at the last point of the decision. It's where we already um, fell in love with the business. We keep talking about it. And now we're thinking, where are we going to put it? <laughs> well, you'll have to let us know when you find that 20 foot space. <laughs> <laughs> but you did find, I this, this image is amazing. I think whoever curated this did a fantastic job. I mean, it's hard to see some of the actual you know, it's work. And, well, and he put them yeah. all on the wall. <laughs> I cannot, I can't imagine the measuring that went into this one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell us what's going on here. What is the, is there a narrative or is it a space issue? How do these images and works yes, relate to uh, it? The narrative is that uh, in part of our collection, um, and I'm, I'm the one curating that, <laughs> and yeah. some, um, <laughs> some, uh, images and some etching that date back, date back uh, from the up to the 17th century um, of etching in African uh, kingdom, mainly from uh, Benin, where I'm originally from and a little bit from Senegal, um, showing uh, our kings and royalty, um, has, how, how they were seen by um, explorer and colonizer um, without any um, false narrative. So you have beautiful etching that I've been collecting from um, collectors from Germany and Belgium. And, and, and then this is the narrative on, that, on, the, on this wall um, that you see. Okay, wonderful. I think this is probably a nice time to introduce our next artist, Jovan C. Speller. Um, hello, are you up here? There we are. So she, Javon, I will let you speak to this, but history as a narrative is obviously predominant in your work. Um, and I think one other thing that Catherine said that I, I thought was really wonderful is that they're all very beautiful and very elegant pieces. Something along those lines you indicated. And when Jovan and I first met, we were going through her, her work and she was talking about the history of her family and the history uh, I'll let her continue on that line. But the, the gist of it was that beautiful. we're dealing with, yeah, beautiful. difficult top topics, but presented in an elegant way or a way that people can live with them and really start to unfold what that history is and what that means to them and obviously in their, their history and their collection. So, Jovan, you want to pipe in? Sure. And I do have a one-year-old on my lap, so <laughs> you might participate as well. Um, but yeah, I think that I we'll like up some stuff because it's sort of wet, but hmm. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> like you said, Jennifer, I, um, we're all kind of research based photographers or artists. And, um, I think that, I think it kind of like really hit me when, um, about three years ago, like when I was pregnant with my first child or four years ago, um, that I really needed to kind of like 
find some sort of understanding related to like my past, my family history. Um, and that was going to require some like heavy research and some travel and, um, and a lot of inquiry and curiosity. And I will say that like those things aren't necessarily like part of my personality. <laughs> Like I'm pretty like homebody, stay closed. Um, and then when I kind of stepped into motherhood, like this need to understand the world on a larger scale, understand history and identity um, more broadly became really important and kind of more pressing. And um, so like a lot of my work and this, the image from the past, from the series that we just looked at um, was all shot in Daddy. Windsor, North Carolina where my father's side of the family is from and where they were enslaved. And, um, and so I think that was really like, you know, trying to understand um, what was carried forward what was brought forward from the past and then like how does it remain like how does it live in the present tense um, and and like how does it contribute now to who who we are as a people, who my family are, who I am as a, as a person and, and like what I can bring um, from that knowledge, from those characteristics that were carried forward from, from like past people, from ancestors, right? Like how does it live today? Um, and it's kind of like the same way that I don't know, I'm sure that most folks here know about um, how Africans, when they were enslaved, like carried um, like rice seed, okra seed, like sewed in their hair, um, you know, across the um, transatlantic, right? Like slave trade, right? We carried things from our home to this new world um, to, uh, to reestablish our, ourselves, to carry, you know, just to kind of like maintain our own identity and sense of, um, and sense of self and sense of place. And I feel like that's kind of what I do with my photography. Um, I do feel like I, I take fragments of what I see um, that are like remnants of the past and remnants of history and kind of like, you know, cut them together, layer them together to create a new narrative that I feel um, contributes to who I am or what I see as relevant today. Mm -hmm. so, and yeah, so how I use history. Yes. And so one other thing that you do that is not generally being done in photography is you, you know, we can talk a little bit about additions. And so right in photography, most everything is additioned, three, five, so it go, can go on. Um, my personal preference is for very small additions. It's not anything that brilliant. It's just a supply and demand <laughs> issue. Um, and I think that it's also important to tier additions. Um, so having said that, Jovan's work is not additioned because it's all unique. And maybe you wanna explain a little bit how that is. You touched on it, but just so- yeah. Yeah, so typically, this actually started a really long time ago. I um, uh, graduated from Columbia College Chicago, so whoop whoop to Columbia. <laughs> um, and and um, I took an alternative processes um, course there and really fell in love with Van Dyke Brown prints in particular. And one of the ways that um, I was using it, you know, you have, you basically create like new negatives and it's a contact print process. And so one of the things that I was doing was cutting together several ne negatives to create a new story and some like a new world you know like I I'm sorry <laughs> we've all done there <laughs> birthday too and he's got like four teeth coming in so there's that oh, no. <laughs> um <laughs> There was one point where I wanted to be an artistic director and like, you know, direct movies and like, like the, the director of photography for movies and like cut these scenes together and create my own world. And I did not have the mind for that kind of technology. And so, um, so I do it in my photography instead. And so I do that with, um, uh, you know, Van Dyke's with the cutting together of negatives, but also when you, when you use that alternative process, kid, let me do this cool um you're painting on the chemistry you know and you can only let me give him to his dad you can only you can only get um you can take a break 
And I'll ask Mama do a question and Catherine a question. You, you, can, you can you can only get that kind of application with chemistry like one time, you know? So it's always unique. And then when I'm cutting these images together and laying layering these images together, I'm hand cutting everything. And so even if I wanted to replicate it and like do two or something like a smaller edition, it just wouldn't be possible. Um, and then the other side of it is that I recycle a lot of my photography. Like I use images from past series and new series. Again, kind of carrying that image forward or that idea forward. And that's all I, that's all I <laughs> You're good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jovan. <laughs> we all know, we've all been there. Oh gosh, there. we know so well <laughs> yes you have four right <laughs> we have four we have four we have twin girls we live with arts in the house and so Jovan, kudos to you you've done it very well yeah. really hot because i had the door closed so that i could be quiet and he's like you're killing me in here mom so. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh but mama doing Catherine. so how do you feel about and how do you address additions because some people we have different feelings on, and I think that would be helpful to hear from. Uh, yeah, we may have different perspective on that. Uh, <laughs> because she will look at the number and say, it has to be small, closer to zero. Right. <laughs> right. right. And then for me, uh, I look at this as a, uh, in a broader uh, sense of uh, uh, what a series means. Is it a, a very unique series that has a place and time? And Often time will tell if that's the case, but also for me, uh, I'll look at if it's something that uh, it will be hard to get at the later stage or where is the artist in that journey, right? And so we have pieces that are unique pieces. We have pieces that we've uh, uh, asked the artists that are to do it, commission pieces. Uh, we don't have uh, pieces that are part of long series, uh, perhaps because Catherine is giving a, a, a cursor of, of how many is too many. <laughs> and, and Catherine, feel free to rebound on that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't have the uh, expertise view of Mamadou on that. It's just a feeling that, um, especially when we set up our uh, acquisition uh, schedule and budget at the beginning of the year, you always feel like if it's a big series that we have time, that this can wait, actually. Let's take this, uh, you know, next year. And it's always pushed back. So it's more the sense of rarity that you yep. is missing when when you have a long series you feel you have time mm -hmm. exactly i think you and i think a lot alike <laughs> Catherine. it's that supply and demand thing and i'm not saying it's right or wrong it's just it's just my feeling especially when i'm looking at an artist who maybe is a little bit younger in their career and because we have i have a couple of those that we're working with and they this artist who's actually in the MLCP auction, um, Shi Hong Dong, he's never shown in the States except for in a recent show with Cameron Gaynor um, at Aspect Ratio Projects, but he does show in Beijing. And we're now, you know, I said, we've got to keep these very small. We want to move these into people's homes and we want to close out some of these additions because it makes, it's that supply and demand thing. It makes people more curious and want to know what you're doing and kind of leading down that road. So, mm -hmm. but, Again, there's no right or wrong. And I like, I like Mamadou thinking about the place and time and where they're at in terms of their career and what that pro special project means too. So I think both perspectives are, are good to have. Um, why don't we dive into what's happening here? And what I like about this image in general, how this arc is displayed is it's a little bit different. It's somewhat like the stairway, but it's salon style versus gallery, right? So. Um, we should maybe touch a little bit upon that. And obviously being from France, I think that, that kind of shows maybe why you would also gravitate towards this where the salon style began. Um, but maybe talk about that, how you decided to position these this way. And is that throughout your home or is it just in some of the slides that we're seeing? How do you approach hanging? So Catherine will cover the, the beauty of how it is all coming together. I can cover the artist. <laughs> right. so, so, I, I art directed and Mamadou was, you know, putting on the wall. Um, here we go. This happened, the setup happened in some places in our home where we have a lot to say in one space. Uh, <laughs> and usually, and Mamadou will speak about this, Carrie Mae Weems, there's uh, James Barnard, who's currently has an exhibition at the Serpentine Galleries and Mama Kassin, but it's 
it's yeah it's really when we want to say a lot of things on the wall um, and again we talk about the size the size is not really important for us uh, we have huge pieces and we have smaller one um, and it's really about the what they say to us yeah <clears throat> and we like having conversation between artists to Catherine's point here you have a piece on the right from Carrie May Williams Cole in the hall where she entered, Rome in the hall where she entered. And it speaks with a piece from James Barner, who was actually uh, Kwame Kruma in Ghana, uh, the former president. And I just like that these two scenery are majestuous in a way, right? You have a, a president uh, of Ghana on one side and you have a, a piece from Carrie May Williams that looks like it's very solemn, it could be a ceremony. And we just kind of love to just type those the two in a corner and they can have a conversation. We felt that it was actually very compelling. And then the other pieces are from a Senegalese photographer that is actually dating back into the early 1900s. His name is uh, Mama Kasse. And often when we think about African contemporary photography, we move straight into the era of, uh, of the uh, CDB and the Keitas. But Mama Kasse produced work 40 years way before they were even considered as photographer. And so for us, we felt that having these very majestuous uh, images from Mama Kasse alongside a piece from Carrie Mae Williamson and James Barnor, the three of them were in a way not uh, related from Ghana to Senegal to the US, but so much connected through the history of Black diaspora and then also the majestuous uh, posture of, of people in power, but also just uh, normal individuals that you see in the Mama Kasse's work. Perfect. And also in that corner, what you have is that uh, one of the theme in our collection is the Af Africa, but in the diasporic terms. So whether it's Brazil or, or America or the Caribbean for us, it's, it's kind of the same conversation. So having Carrie Mae Williams here was important because it's, it's the continuity as well. Nice. You guys must have a lot of interesting dialogue in your home. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, oh, let's address this before we kind of pivot to the next topic that I wanted to, to discuss. This is, okay, so the perspective of this looks like they're hanging on the wall, correct? They, yes, they are. They are. And yeah. they're looking down. They're looking down. Okay, so what is purposeful about that? I mean, I think, you know, it's like people don't think about all these intricacies when you come to exhibiting art in your home or living with art. I mean, maybe the placement was determined by the gallerist or the place that you purchased it, or maybe you came up with this, maybe share a little bit about that because I found this really interesting. Yeah, so there's uh, two reasons why. So uh, um, the official reason is for aesthetic purpose. Um, so <laughs> it's a beautiful sculpture and there's details on top is, is the head. It's from, um, from Benin, but you see this traditional sculpture in Nigeria as well. Um, it is exactly the same. Um, and we wanted to show those pieces in all their majesty. And then the second reason is practical is that we have four children who play soccer <laughs> in the home. And that was the safest place until a, a ball hit one of them during, you know, the lockdown and fell. <laughs> um, so that's the reason. But what is interesting is that the galleries representing these artists in France um, after an article that appeared, he started to um, hang some of them like us. In the same way. <laughs> I love it. I love, well, that's one of the practicalities of living with art and having a family and having children. Look at Javon's demonstrating right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, you know, and, and I know I've spoken with collectors. They're like, oh, I love that piece. It's huge. It would take up an entire wall, but my kids run in a circle, you know, through the middle of the home and how are we going to deal with that? And I mean, those are just practical things that you have to. <laughs> it's part of our decision process as well. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, okay, let's move on to the next slide. I think, perfect, right here. I, I would like, well, A, to introduce Derek Woods Morrow. I'm sorry to have left you hanging over there, Derek. Are you, are you still with us? I'm here, I'm awake, I'm entertained. Jovan, I'm show. everyone's got great conversation. I'm good. good. Oh, well, good. Well, thank you so much for making it tonight. I know you had some other stuff going on. We appreciate it. 
I would like to talk here about how, about the intersection of artist, collector, and gallerist. And um, this piece, I'll let you go into more detail because um, it's more complex and I, I should share it since it's yours. But we were working on a show from Aspect Ratio um, at the end of last year and the beginning of this year, a group show. And Derek had a body of work and we wanted to include something in the show and I had chosen, it was dealing with basically everything that had happened in 2020 and we were trying to present it in a very elegant way. So it was just the shower image without the um, secondary image of the policeman cop in the center. And I was looking at it as isolation and that's the component of 2020 I was looking to have. And then Derek, you can continue from here, felt very strongly that he wanted Adam, this cop in, in the work, in the piece that was displayed. So. Derek came up with this solution and maybe you just want to tell us a little bit about that body of work and about how, you know, we kind of came together, your thoughts, but we came to an agreement of like something that would really work with the show, which stayed true to your practice. And I think it's a nice way to demonstrate that partnership, but you can go forward. <laughs> well, hey, thank you for having me. I'm Derek Smarrow. Um, when I, when I think about it looks like we're, we're thinking about children a lot right now. I mean, we have this like Javon, <laughs> but like so much of my work is really about my connection to my childhood and trying to sort of navigate this adulthood body that wants to connect with this childhood self. Um, and that's because when I was a child, I had this sort of freedom to like exist in North Carolina, in the woods, run around and be a wild child and dream and have like an imagination to be anything and everything. And so sometimes in my work, I'm sort of navigating what it means to connect with that. And so this particular work um, centers a reconnection that I had with a childhood friend who grew up to be a police officer. And we hadn't spoken in 15 years. And I return home after 15 years of not speaking with Adam, who was also like a childhood boyfriend of mine. And I, you know, I was like highly exploratory and uh, even sexually exploratory at a very young age with people my own age. Um, and there was something of having this intimate relationship with this person who after, I know 20 years later being held at gunpoint in the Chicago back alley, I had a different relationship to the police, right? Like as a large black man in the world. And so I return home and reconnect with Adam. And there's this process of like being let inside of something that you also kind of want out of. And so my work is kind of dicey, right? Like the work is, I'm always trying to play with the slippage of the problem because it's not a black and white issue. It isn't, it's like a systemic issue, right? That we're talking about. And so this is um, maybe conceptually really thinking about the, um, I don't know, innate language in photography, a bit like Cameron's thinking about, but there is sort of this inverted image of the shower in the precinct. Um, and then the police officer, which is Adam, is photographing into a mirror and the images are directly compressed on top of each other. Um, and there's a lot here about interior space being both emotional um, and like exterior wishes also being very emotional compressed into one single image. Um, and then, you know, that's, that's this particular work. And there's other, there's, that work feels like traumatic in so many ways. And then there's other photographs where I just spend time with like black queer people in the rural South. And we just spend time playing or spend time together resting. And we just, we take photographs together. And so like, I think my practice is trying to make a whole of the experience of existing as black in the world. It is not trying to pick particular compartments of my existence, it's trying to explore all of them. And one of the ways I'm exploring another like thing that I feel implicated in is like, I am a person who grew up in a rural space, went to the North trying to escape, realizing how dangerous it is to just exist anywhere as the person I am. And then began really thinking about the system of capitalism. And so like, as someone who does, sometimes so work in galleries, it felt really important for me to try to develop some type of structure that would maybe, um, I don't know, like pro a production of culture. Um, and so for my first edition prints, um, only black collectors can collect the first editions of my prints. And my work is ascending, right? So like each edition gets more expensive. So I want the most accessible point to create a culture of bringing more black collectors into. Um, contact with my work to be inherent in the capitalist structure of the world we live in, you know? And so maybe that way we can grow more black collectors. Um, I can think that like oftentimes people are like, are you an identity artist? And I'm like, I'm interested in the formation of the body and I'm grappling with safety and futurity. It's not about identity. It's about like 
furthering my existence and the existence of other people. And so the last thing I'll, I'll say is that like oftentimes when I do collaborate with people, maybe not Adam, <laughs> the black and queer folks I spoke about before, when I write contracts, they're not model releases, they're interlocutor releases. Like, so that there's stake for the people who are part of the community, the trans, queer, gender, queer folks, intersex folks who I'm navigating in community with, that there's some equity built into the work as well. And so that's kind of, that, that's a lot uh, in a little bit of time about the way I <laughs> No, well, you, you actually beat me to it because I was going to ask you questions about, um, about just that, how, you know, just through conversations, and again, all credit to you, um, but just through our conversations of you explaining to me what was important to you, and that was to get more art into Black collectors. Oh, wow. um, and so, air together, oh, oops, I'm <laughs> just, just trying to kind of further emphasize the, the relationship that a gallerist can have with an artist and then can have with a collector as the next step. And so, you know, I'm so happy that this was the resolution that came to and, and that this is the program that we're going to move forward with. You can accomplish your goal as a um, Black collector. No, not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a first step. Like I'm still in the production and producing, like I'm trying to produce culture. So there will be other ways in which, you know, in my practice, we think about how to right the evils and wrongs and also think about how we're implicated in structure. Like if I do have a platform and I am working with other people, um, I recently did a contract with a large company and it was really important that although they were paying me for my work, that each of the people in my photographs was also getting paid for the work that they did years ago. Yeah, like that just seemed important, you know, to me. Um, and you know, I don't. I know it's not perfect, because it's never really perfect. But like, I'm trying. Yeah. Well, there's no such thing as perfect. You'll be happy to hear. <laughs> but it is. It's an important step, and it's important to put it out there. And I think, you know, going back to how collectors, I, I personally, I know not all gallerists or dealers think this way. Um, a lot of them do. I'm not that unique at all, but, but I think it's super important for artists to meet the collectors. So if someone purchases your work or takes a stake in your career is kind of more how I think of it. I think that connection between, you know, I, I can step out of it. That connection between the artist and the collector is really vital. And I know Mamadou and Catherine, um, I believe feel the same way. You do a lot to you com I mean, commission, underwrite exhibitions and support artists who you have, who have acquired. And maybe you want to talk a little bit about that. Sure. I mean, for us, it's above and beyond uh, owning a piece. And in the sense of ownership for me, it's always misleading because I don't, it's actually the artists that are doing us the courtesy of allowing us to collect their work. And mm -hmm. so for me, it should be a reverse relationship. Uh, I don't think that the monetary aspect of it gives just justice as to say. Uh, because obviously living with a piece of art in your house or in your life uh, give you way more than what you pay for often, unless you overpaid for it. Right. Now, uh, <laughs> in, in the notion of collecting, there is different notion of it. Uh, if you collect in a sense of accumulating wealth and you see out as an asset class, I'm a banker, so I can talk to you about it in a separate conversation. But if ultimately for you, it's a, a way to... Uh, uh, appreciate the arts at large, then it's, it's a different mindset than if you were to look at it as, a, as, as an investment as per se. And the reason why we believe that it goes and beyond just uh, collecting art pieces, uh, for us supporting exhibitions, artists directly, uh, taking a stake in their journey, it's actually a great human experience. That's mm -hmm. where it starts. Uh, the conversation we have in artists on Zoom calls on Sunday, this is our artist day. We, we have a three hour slot where between the kids and the preparing for the week, we can engage. Uh, we've always enjoyed this conversation. We leave conversation enriched uh, by having a better sense of where the artist is coming from. And then also it inspires our own work. Catherine being a jeweler can tell you more about that. Uh, and so how interacting with artists impact her practice. For me, it's way more uh, complicated. I manage money for a living. <laughs> and so if I start uh, managing the way I feel art, you may not see any returns. 
but Catherine can share more about her design and see how it is inspired into her own practice. Um, the, the relationship with artists is also a, a relationship of, uh, I will say, admiration and, and exchange because uh, in my, you know, jewelry practice as well, I, I look at, you know, symbolism and, and stories and culture as well. So it's really more a conversation uh, that I have with some, with some of them. And to go back to Mamadou's point about beyond collecting, for us it's really, and that's why we have different theme in our collection, is really, um, and I always, I often say that it's really helping someone like writing a book and you don't own the book. So it's really, it's beyond the acquisition. It's really helping um, someone else, another creative tell their story. Uh, and sometimes their, their side of history. Mm -hmm. I know, I think uh, there are a couple of people on here that may have heard me say this before, but when, whenever I've been asked, like, why did I get into art? And what, what's so interesting about this to me, it, it, it truly comes down to one thing that I have always, from a very young age, had just this admiration and respect for the bravery of artists to create something and put it out there that's so highly personable personal, excuse me, um, and to really be criticized oftentimes, you know, and, and yet they do it over and over again and uh, keep trying to improve or whatever it is that their personal goals are. And I just think that that is super brave. And that's a huge part of why I've always wanted to advocate for artists. And it sounds like, you know, for you, it's, it's a similar thing. And, and the rewards that come back from trying to do that um, are huge. So it's, it's a, it's a great relationship. And I see now I'm not paying any attention to time, so I don't know where we're at, but <laughs> a few of these um, images at the end, I'm just going to say, we're when perusing through your, your um, PDF or your um, presentation that you sent over, Catherine, these were just some of my favorites. <laughs> and, I mean, there were so many to choose from, um, but also Nate is from Minneapolis, which is where I'm from. And we represent a lot of Minnesota artists. Um, Cameron is one of them, Jovan's another. Um, and I know Cameron is very close friends with Nate. So I've seen this, this piece before and I just really love it. But feel free to chime in and talk about maybe why you acquired it. If we have the time, I'm not sure. So <laughs> there is a is an acquisition that we made here uh, in Chicago from a Chicago gallery. Um, he teaches at the uh, School of the Art Institute, so it was um, I will say a good cur. Naomi Beckwith uh, introduced us to his work at Expo Chicago, so it was very um, Chicago. But on the bigger picture, it was also a desire from us. Uh, we've been in the U.S. five years, and really we saw so art the history whole element of it is, is very important. So it's also for us an introduction to um, an exploration of African-American uh, American history through the African-American uh, angle as well. Right. Do you agree? <laughs> I don't have to agree. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, but no, it's uh, the, the part that attracted me the most, and actually, Jovan, that piece is actually mirror very well with, with your story, because here you have, uh, well, the piece is called the, uh, the Votive, but it's actually a horse bone that uh, led uh, Nate to do a research onto his family history and the jockey uh, within the families that kind of, uh, uh, kind of emerge. And the jockey syndrome that is written that you cannot really read here, talks about how uh, when African-American were mastering a craft, then the rules were always changed. And so it's actually very timely when you think about the conversation we were having over the past few months. It's also linked to history with that notion of jockey and, and how African-American mastered a jockey at a time where uh, slavery was just prominent. And so there is, a, for me, that dual narrative of being so relevant to the day we are today and also so linked to history and then Nate digging into uh, finding the horse bone and then putting that in that case in wood, which is very solemn as well. So very powerful piece. It is, it is. He's on a big Western kick, right, Cameron? <laughs> is he still with us? Oh, did he bow out? <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> well, we were talking about that. So yes, but this is a, you, you hit all the important points and it's true. This is a really powerful piece. Um, um, I'm in Omaha, Nebraska. Oh yeah. I came across this film, Black Rodeo, and I'm really excited to make some work with it, but I really want to find like a 70 year old black gay cowboy. <laughs> like just someone who has an entire history of having done this overly masculine work. And then like this sort of, um, you know, just like questions of semantics. So like barebacking and language that has come into queer culture also mm -hmm. being very heavily linked to like this hyper masculine thing. And then in the black rodeo film, one of the most beautiful things is when they get off the horses, they cling to another black like horseback rider and they hold on to them and hug them before they come off. And so I know I'm really excited to make some work about horses too. <laughs> like three months. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> I think that's great. <laughs> we'll be watching for that, Derek. <laughs> um, all right. Do we I think we have a couple more images, maybe, Natasha. Oh, yes. Okay. Love. It's just, I mean, I don't even know what to say about this other than it's completely striking. You can fill in the whole history about it, but um, it's aesthetically just incredibly moving. The way the composition, um, the way the whole thing comes together, her, her strong pose, the bright red. Um, I would love to hear a little more about the history of this and, and what, how you came upon it. Catherine? <laughs> I should pass it to one of you, right? My, I need my newscaster hat. Yeah. <laughs> you can talk about it. Sure, sure, sure. So, an outstanding artist uh, named Alun B. He's French, Senegalese. And by the way, that piece is actually at the Cabra only as we speak. It's part of a series called Edification. And at the MOCP. Uh, pardon me? And at the MOCP. Of course, of mm. course. That's, I always leave the best for, for, the, for the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, but then uh, I came across a series where actually Alun was still taking photographs in Senegal. And then, so I had a preview of the project before even he, he actually printed the, uh, the, the images. And when I saw this image, it was pretty much a, uh, I was knocked out. And, and for me, there's so many things that are happening at the same time. It's about Afrofuturism. You see the, the goggles and then looking ahead. It's about heritage. You see the craft and the, and the dress that the young girl is wearing. Uh, superpower, uh, proud with the, the cap kind of uh, floating in the air, the beautiful scenery being on a tip of Goric Island where the slave was shipped from Africa to America. Uh, and then there's so many part of it that is actually linked to history, also hopeful because it's about the future. There is a sense of pride with her having her hands on her hips. We have twin girls and as you enter our house, this is the first thing they see uh, when they leave the house and when they come into the house every day. And with them, we want them to have a sense of, you know, being proud, being proud of who they are and being proud of their power and who they are a woman. And um, it's essentially above and beyond colors. For me, art is above and beyond colors. But in the fact that everything was encapsulated there and then and, and Natasha helped us uh, of, uh, having that piece at the MOCP and, the, and uh, having Alun part of an exhibition that was called In Their Own Form. And ever since his career has taken off. So Tash, thank you for your uh, stewardship around that piece. And I'm glad it's also part of the collection of the MOCP. You see, the last, what a, <laughs> oh, look, what a perfect way <laughs> to wrap it up. Um, well, I should pass it. Um, do we have questions that people would like to ask? If anyone would like to unmute or we can read from the chat if we have time. Where's, where's Tash? I'm here. Oh, Thank you very much. Sorry about Sometimes my computer kept skipping ahead, so I apologize for that. Perfect. You were <laughs> really good. Pictures jumping around sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, ending on uh, Alun, Alun Bay is uh, it's one of our most favorite images, and it's it joined our collection. Uh, we were introduced to uh, the artist um, through Mamadou and Catherine, and so it was a great way of of how the museum also um, is introduced to artists uh, is through, through galleries, through the artists themselves and through collectors. Um, and that's been a really wonderful piece. 
uh, well, we, we own a few of the pieces uh, from that series, uh, but they have been borrowed uh, several times for other exhibitions, the works um, that we have loaned out. And so it's really um, uh, a wonderful work that we were introduced to. Uh, I think that was four years ago now. Yeah, wow, well, already. <laughs> yeah. So I'd love to open it up for any um, questions. I think the easiest, the, the chat, I don't see any questions in the chat, just more comments. But if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself um, and, and join in. <laughs> or maybe we covered everything. We were so thorough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, if there are no further questions, it is eight o'clock. And I, I want to um, thank uh, Jennifer um, and all of the artists, um, as well as, of course, Mamadou and Catherine, for all of your support. Uh, this is a reminder that uh, these um, three, um, three artists are in um, the auction that launches on Friday uh, through Sotheby's. And I would welcome anybody who is in Chicago to um, come and see the works in person. Um, if, you, if, you, if you would like, you are welcome to join us um, in person on, 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 on Friday, uh, on this Friday, um, we are uh, launching the, the, the works uh, will be available to look at in person. Um, and then next week, all of uh, Monday through Friday, you can look at the works in person if you just call the museum and we'll, we'll, show, we'll show you all of those works. Um, and we encourage everyone to join us um, on June 10th. Uh, please register at mocp.org. You'll find the darkroom event. Please register for our virtual event. Um, it will be very fun and we're having a virtual cocktail party. Like right now. Like right now, but we're going to, yes, I don't have my cocktail. <laughs> I didn't even take a sip. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, artists. Thank you. Collectors. It was great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye, Tash.